Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Kanika Rajan will present How Brain Circuits Function in Health and Disease, Understanding Brain-Wide Circuit Flow. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $418 million to fund more than 6,000 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Kanika Rajan. Dr. Rajan is assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience and the Friedman Brain Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She was a BBRF 2014 Young Investigator grantee. Today's webinar will begin with a presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rajan. Kanika, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Borenstein. And I'm delighted to, um, to join this, you know, exalted foundation. Um, yeah, you know, I, as, I, as I go on, it'll become clear how, you know, everything that I've done in my lab and I've been able to accomplish has been because of seed funding that the BBRF um, gave me at a rather awkward stage in my career. Um, and so with that, I would like to begin my talk. Um, I'd like to start by thanking my colleagues and key collaborators, um, people in my lab, primarily Dr. Matt Perrick, he's a postdoc um, in my lab on the job market. I'm going to be presenting data um, and um, you know, results from my lab that have been done in collaboration with Carl Dizeroff. And you can see from the asterisk um, on his name here how he's also benefited from um, early investments by the Brain and Behavior Foundation in its back in its NARSAD days, in fact. Um, and so, you know, what, what NARSAD sparked off um, has been, you know, a, a, you know, a lot of other funding, obviously. But at a stage when these ideas were, you know, you know, innovative is really code for, you know, high risk. Risk. And so what were, what were crazy sounding ideas then? And so we really deeply appreciate um, the foundation's faith in our work. In our work. Um, and I hope to convince you that that's been a fruitful, um, fruitful thing to do so far. So in life, um, you know, behaviors that we perform in, involve evaluating whether the actions that we make are worth the effort or not. So we're constantly evaluating, we're picking among these actions. And, you know, whether or not we're, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic we end up being seems to be, you know, a result of how many of these actions end up being fruitful. So let's say we keep trying our best to do something and then, you know, these efforts appear fruitless then these experiences can be perceived by the brain as persistent and inescapable stress. And I will keep returning to this phrase as we keep going. And in the extreme, that can cause a state that is reminiscent of hopelessness. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, in, in clinical settings, and I use this with a lot of caution because I'm a computational neuroscientist, um, you know, this can look like learned helplessness. Hopelessness has seen in many experimental settings, there's a lot of convergent experimental and clinical um, evidence pointing to this across multiple nervous systems. So here's one example in an experimental setting in which hopelessness has been observed. So, you know, this is a rodent in a tank of water. There's no perch and it's called a forced swim test. And so in this situation, initially, you know, as a rodent finds this stressful, it makes an initially vigorous response, as you can see in the number of times it kicks the coil as a function of time. And, you know, initially there's this vigorous response to try and evade the stressful thing that's happening to it. And that's often known as an active coping phase. 
And eventually, because the rodent doesn't succeed in finding a perch or get itself out of the water, hence the term forced swim, it goes into a state where it ceases these movements or you know, slows them down significantly. And that's called passive coping. Active and passive coping are both adaptive. So in the face of persistent and inescapable stress, a lot of animals and human beings undergo this phase transition from active coping to passive coping. Now, in maladaptive conditions, such as in major depressive disease, or in other situations in which learned helplessness might arise, the onset point of this passive coping may be advanced a little. So, you know, a small amount of stress may be sufficient to have the animal or even the person lapse into a passive coping or learned helpless state. Now, this has been studied in a number of nervous systems. And, you know, let me walk you through this um, through the schematic because we're going to return to this a lot. Um, so it's been studied in mice and rats, and it's reminiscent of a lot of, you know, uh, phenomenologies that are seen in pathological states, um, such as in uh, major depressive diseases. And so one of the luxuries that I have as a computational theorist is to really ask a question like this. Are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved when you go from a small nervous system, such as the larval zebrafish, which I'm about to introduce to you, to larger nervous systems, such as the mouse, the rat, and eventually to the human brain, where you know access is progressively reduced, behavioral complexity is exponentially expanded, or is there anything fundamental and unifying about this? Or are there key divergences between species when you're talking about this phenomenon of learned helplessness? And that's where computational models really shine because they're not bound by the you know, idiosyncrasies of a single experiment. They're not bound by the limitations of working with a single system. They can look beyond one model system and start to build you know, a fundamental understanding, which I think is a human, it's a, it's a very deep human drive is to look for these types of unifying threads. And so one of the class of computational models that I build are called neural networks. And you can think of them as Lego models, right? So what I do is essentially take small modules, computer models, and each of those can be thought of as a Lego building block. And I wire multiple ones of them together in this modular framework. And when I say they're constrained directly by experimental data, I'm about to show you examples of how. I use data collected in the labs of my experimental colleagues, collaborators that I have in all of these domains, to figure out how these blocks, these Lego blocks, are fit together. Now, since I have built this model, right, I have built this model, I know what the pieces are that went into it. So I am able to do to this model what is often known as reverse engineering. So I can analyze this Lego model, this facsimile, a very simplified facsimile, mind you, of the biological system and analyze them using data analysis methods of which there's a lot today and some of which we have to invent specifically for this purpose. But what these models buy you is control. And I want to show you today how this particular approach can be used to infer mechanisms that are inaccessible from measurements alone. So, you know, one of these examples is what I will show you. I have written several papers on the subject, on this general topic of how to build neural network models inspired by experimental data directly from the outset, which brings us close to biology, but still remain tractable. So let's return to this paradigm that we saw before, right? Um, I'm going to be talking about a different experimental system, but this is a useful framework to think about why we're going to this other nervous system. So this is the slide that you've already seen before. The animal, you know, copes with the initial stress by making a vigorous movement, active coping. If the stress is persistent and inescapable, it lapses into passive coping. This has been studied in the mouse extensively, and the mouse neurobiology is extremely complex and rich. So a number of brain regions, as you can see labeled here, the details aren't terribly important. What I wanna, want you to take away from the slide is that a number of brain regions, essentially the whole brain is involved intricately and in very complex ways in mediating this behavior, behavioral state transition from active coping to passive coping. And indeed, it's a whole field of, field of work and there's you know, hundreds of papers that have been written on the subject. 
So a couple of terms that I want to draw your attention to is this thing called the habenula and this thing called the raphe. And I'll tell you why, but I'm going to return to these regions over and over. Now, mice are, you know, they're, you know, are our tractable nervous system, but they, you can't sample the entire brain of the mouse while it's undergoing this entire behavior, right? Technologies are improving, and maybe in my lifetime, we can get to be able to have a view into the entire brain-wide machinery of the mouse during this, you know, several minutes long behavioral experience. But what we wanted to do instead was to go to a nervous system that gives you a lot of access and enter the larval zebrafish. And larval zebrafish are, you know, these translucent um, animals. Their eyes are on this side, the tail will be off to the page on the left. And what the goal here is would be to see if I can extract mechanisms from smaller brains where I have access to everything and see if the same principles can be used to guide my search in a systematic manner to these larger and more complex brains. And so, you know, this is what the larval zebrafish looks like. This has been head fixed in a block of agar. The behavior, of course, is a little bit more impoverished when you think about it compared to the mouse, or in fact, certainly when you compare it to the human being. And so what we're doing here is to just, you know, sort of measure the number of times its tail waggles. So active coping here would lead to more tail waggles. Passive coping would be when the fish is given up and doesn't. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail. The key here is that, you know, its neurobiology also involves many different nuclei um, or brain regions anatomically parcellated, except they also have homologies with the mammalian system, specifically with these nuclei that I told you to put a pin in, the habenula and the raphae. They're both present in the larval zebrafish. So this started to say to us, listen, we can start to build these mechanistic understanding or principles of you know, what can cause this type of thing because experiments will let us look at every single neuron in the behaving larval zebrafish as a function of a very long period of time. So let me describe to you the experiment um, briefly, and then I will tell you a little bit about how modeling helped us go beyond the details of the experiment to, you know, best leverage these data. So this is a very the highly simplified theorist's view of a very complex experiment. And so here's a larval zebrafish, right? That's what you see as a, marked as a control zebrafish. And at some point, it starts to be uh, the uh, postdoc in Carl Dyseroth lab, Aaron Andelman, a very talented person, delivered very small shocks to the animal. So at, you know, not periodic intervals, because we didn't want the animal to be able to predict when the next shock was coming. Remember these uh, zebrafish were head fixed in that their heads were not free to move, only their tails were waggling. So what these fish do is at the start of when the shocks start to come on, these fish waggle their tails a lot vigorously, trying to evade the stress that's happening to them. But they can get away because they're head fixed and also because the shocks are preset to be delivered. And so what happens over time is that the stress builds up, as you can see in this little blue cartoon here. The animal, we think, perceives it as a persistent and inescapable stress and eventually says, screw it, I'm not swimming anymore. So it goes into this passive coping state. And so the beauty of experiments um, involving larval zebrafish is, well, we can, you know, obviously monitor their behavior um, because it's kind of simplified. And so we can extract a simple measure of what, what their behavior is like. And so what we did here was to calculate the number of times its tail waggles on the y-axis as a function of time on the x-axis. And in pink, the bar that you see here is the duration of the challenge period or the duration during which the shocks are presented to the animal. In black are averages of the tail waggles over time for control fish, and in blue are the shocked fish. So look what happens. The shocks start to come on at the beginning of the pink bar, and the animal wiggles its tail a lot to try and evade this unexpected shock. And so there's an enhancement in the tail waggle velocity relative to control. The blue is greater than the black. And eventually, over time, the blue lapses much below the black in terms of the number of times the tail waggles as a function of time. And so the first phase with this vigorous enhancement in movement is called active coping. And then the one that's, you know, one where it has, you know, essentially ceased moving is called passive coping. Now, the beauty of working with uh, 
tremendous experimentalists like Carl Weisroth, with whom we have an ongoing collaboration that I'm going to talk about in a bit, is that they're also able to what is called cal do calcium imaging of the entire brain of this larval zebrafish during this multi-minute long experiment. And this is what this, these data look like. So what you should see in the video is different neurons in the brain of the larval zebrafish glowing to indicate electrical activity in them during the experiential state. And so you can see here already different neurons in different parts of the brain. To orient you, the left of the image is the head and the right of the image is the tail. And so different neurons in different parts of the larval zebrafish brain glow to indicate electrical activity at different time points. They stay on for different amounts of time and they do these interesting and complicated things, right? So what did you know, essential data analysis of looking at this activity provide? This is something the experimentalists could do. They didn't need a theorist like me in here for this. So what they ended up doing was to look at the habenula and the raphe, because those are regions that we know from studies on the mammalian system could be involved. So this is where the habenula is in the same fish. Here's a little image of, this, of the video that you saw before. And in blue is the habenula. The observation was that as the stresses build up, activity in the habenula started to rise. And let me walk you through this plot for a bit. So here's the average electrical activity measured as a delta F over F, or the amount of you know, the glow of the calcium as a function of the time. Dashed line is where the shocks first come on. Black is control as always, blue is shock as always. And you can see that when the shocks start to come on, the habenula does seem to start to integrate the amount of stress by building up. This should be very reminiscent of the previous picture where the stresses were ramping up. Now they also looked at activity in the raphe, which is known to be downstream of this first region habenula. And here I've marked where it is. And that seemed to go in the opposite direction. It seemed to inhibit its response as a function of the shock, where you can see the blue is below the black. So are we done, right? Are these two things sufficient for us to say, well, these two effects caused active to passive coping? Answer is no, right? Because we don't know what shut down the movement. We also don't know, are there any other parts of the brain that are involved? Because clearly in the video that we saw before, many other things were also lighting up, right? And so if we return to this picture, we see that there's essentially brain-wide activity. So what do we mean by something like mechanism, right? So this is, you know, we're back to the same slide I told you before, except I've posted on top the question we want to ask. We want to ask, what is the brain-wide mechanism that mediates the active to passive coping in zebrafish? So let me tell you a story. Here's the story, which is, you know, loose, loose term for a hypothesis that we were looking for. Bad stuff's happening to the fish, right? Shocks are coming in and the uh, habenula is the quetcher. It goes, bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening every time a shock comes. And that seems to be integrating, like building up. It sends a projection to the raphe which goes, listen, I'm going to, the Rafi's job, as we know, is to dump serotonin into the system. It's a neurotransmitter. It is supposed to mitigate the effects of this, right? So Rafi says, listen, cavalry is here. I hope you feel better. Did the fish feel better? Answer, no, because the fish did lapse into passive coping. So what shut down the movement? That's what we mean by something like a brain-wide mechanism. We're looking to close the loop. We're looking to go beyond the experimental observations and say, well, what really happened here? So how do we get at this, right? So as I said in the slide before, we build these computational models, which are Lego blocks. So let me walk you through what happens, and then I'll tell you if our story worked out or not. So what we do first is to the class of networks that we use are called recurrent neural networks because, um, because of the nature of the interactions. So this is what would be a single Lego block. Each neuron is a, you know, a ball in this diagram that you see here. And the, the term recurrence just means that they're not connected in one direction like a chain, but in fact, neurons are connected to many other neurons and connections go every which way. There's feedback connections and feed forward connections. That's what is recurrence essentially. 
right? So we take one of these, and incidentally, my entire PhD was on the subject of these single module recurrent neural networks, or RNNs for short. So if you hear me say RNNs, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Now, this is fine for a single region, but look at the revolutionary data we're working with, right? We're talking about many brain regions interacting. So the first thing we needed to do was to scale this to multi-regions. And I'm only showing you three out of a possible 21 for the larval zebrafish, right? So here's three that I've connected through these inter-area projections. So each of these is this self-similar kind of single module. RNNA could be the RAFE or the habenula, RNNC could be the raphae or the habenula, RNNB could be another brain region in the fish. And you could just play this game over and over and have this modular multi-region RNN. So why are these useful, right? Why is this way of constructing this Lego model useful? It's useful because let's, let's look at the single module case for a second. You can understand everything you need to know about models like this by looking at a thing inside it called the directed interaction matrix. And so I'm going to take a second and pedantically drag you through this because it's, it's, it's worth it, I promise. So what this matrix does is capture the pairwise interaction. So every neuron's connection to everyone else and the direction with which it is connected to everyone else in this module is captured in this one mathematical object. It's easy to visualize, but the properties of this matrix will tell you everything you need to know about how this thing will behave. Now, if you were to hook more of them together to perform a multi-region RNN, you get a slightly structured form of the same matrix because now each of these individual matrices that you saw before, each directed interaction corresponds to interactions within the region along these blocks, as you can see in the darker ones. And all of these other ones will tell you the connections from other regions. So the block in blue will tell you what the directionality and magnitude of the interactions are in RNNA. In yellow, all the connections in RNNB and in RNNC would be the ones in red. And these can be three different brain regions. And the connections that go from, I apologize, and the connections that go from region B to region A are in this block over here right next to the blue, and the connections that go from region C to region A are in the third block over here. And there's all possible combinations in this nine matrix blob. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing we do is to modify this toy model to match data directly. And this is what I meant when I said we constrain these with data directly. And so this is, uh, you know, our bread, you know, our bread and butter in this lab. So we're, as I said, in this revolutionary part of neuroscience where people are monitoring bigger um, data sets constantly. We have access to richer neural data sets and richer behavioral data sets. So what we end up doing, and this is my only slide with equations, I promise, is to take the activity of each of these model units that you see, which is the balls here. They will, if you wire them up initially, they look kind of random, like the thing that you see in red. And we train this network. This process is called training we match it to, uh, to data directly. So this is what the activity of each unit that you saw in the larval zebrafish picture would look like. We change this Lego model. We change the way that these, these blocks are assembled until the, the red trace and the blue trace match. And since I have done this, right? Since I have taken this block and I have modified it until, you know, the, you know, the Lego model of the Death Star looks like the Death Star on Star Wars, I have, you know, albeit impoverished, I have some idea of the operating principles. See there, now you know my entire research program. So what do you gain from this exercise, right? We went from a single module, a single RNN, to potentially a brain-wide facsimile, so we get from it a multi-region RNN model that quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, right? So that produces realistic neural dynamics. Yes, because that's what we're training it to do. These models are extremely powerful and we have shown multiple times that they can do this. Really the strength of this is our ability to look under the hood. I have built the Lego model of the Death Star, right? So I can look at how the bits are assembled. And that's the idea of inferring consistent directed interactions. So how is every single unit in it connected to every other one, potentially brain-wide? 
is not something you can get from just looking at measurements. You'd have to go through this exercise in order to infer these directed interactions. Now, really cool aspect of this is what I'm going to tell you about because we're super excited about it, is another thing that you can't get from experiments alone, which is the actual flow of information, which is the currents that these neurons, let's say you pick a single neuron in your, in your region of interest. What is its experience, you know, based on its interactions with everyone in its own region? What is its experience relative to the other neurons in the other regions? That's the idea of looking at currents due to recurrence within and between areas. And these check marks are here to indicate the fact that these are quantities that are inaccessible for measurements alone, but computational models are able to give us these quantities. So let me show you one of these, right? So here's region A, region B, and region C. That the third thing I told you we're able to do is to look at these um, the currents due to recurrence, right? So once you've trained these models to match the data, just a little recap of what I already told you is you get activations that are similar to data because these models are powerful and they can be trained to match data. So that alone is only a small sized whoop. The really big sized whoop is the fact that we can infer these directed interactions. So we can look at the actual magnitude and directionality of the, all of the connections within region A or the connections going from region B to region A in this block, or the connections going from region C to region A in this block. And we can look at other combinations too, such as what is the experience of everything in region B from region A and region C and so forth. Now, it turns out that if you do a dot product of these two objects, one of which you could only get by fitting this RNN model, you can extract the information flow in terms of the currents. So the actual flow of currents from region A, from other neurons in region A, from neurons in region B to region A, from C to region A. And that's why we named this method current-based decomposition, or CURBED for short. So if you hear me talk about CURBED in the rest of the talk, I'm looking at these currents. So let's see what happens, right? Here, I have returned to the same slide that we said before, right? We've shown through looking at the data that was collected experimentally, that there's a steady increase in the activity of the habenula. There's a decrease in the activity of the raphe, all consistent with the original story. What we wanted to do is to go and search for, is there a cortex in the zebrafish, like an infralimbic cortex in mammals, for example, that is responsible for shutting down the movement? This is the search we're on. And I want, I'm about to tell you whether or not we find it. So in order to get at this, we build a multi-region RNN model. So you've seen a schematic like this before, except now area A will be trained to match activity from the habenula. So that's why I've called it habenula-like. In blue, the cartoon shows area C or RN, uh, Raffae-like. Now I'm looking at another region, right? So we found a conveniently named blob called the telencephalon in the larval zebrafish atlas. And so we called area B telencephalon-like. And now we're about to see if this is the region that did something special to shut down the movement. And so just to orient you once again, the habenula and the raphe are where I said they would be in the, in the picture of the, of the fish, and telencephalon is here. Now for, you know, the theoretically minded among you, the telencephalon was also kind of convenient for us because it had a lot of units in it, a lot of firing neurons. It was very rich in activity. And so if we were interested in looking beyond just interactions between the raphe and the habenula, which we had explored in our 2019 cell paper, we wanted to look for something that could capture some of the neuronal diversity and richness um, without scaling to the full complexity of all 21 regions. So there's a couple of convenient regions why we picked, you know, telencephalon as a third region. So once again, in a cartoon, telencephalon in yellow, habenula in blue, and raphe in red. And that's the color scheme you'll see in, um, in, in the remainder of the talk. And yet we did exactly as I had told you before. We took a single region and scaled it to three to get a three region RNN model. We took the activity of each unit in this model and we changed the connections until the activity matched experimental data directly. And that's what comes out of it. So here's neural activity, which is the calcium fluorescence delta F over F of a single unit in one of these model, model RNNs as a function of time. And I've plotted in blue a habenula-like RNN unit 
and in red, a raphae-like RNN unit, and in yellow, a telencephalon-like RNN unit. In all three of these, these are just randomly selected from this massive, um, massive three-region network. And in all three graphs, the, the trace that you see in gray behind the, the traces in, in the colors is the actual data that these networks were trained to match. So you can kind of see, right, if you look carefully, you can see that, you know, the network misses these, you know, very spiky bits or the very high frequency wiggles, but it kind of gets most of the other trends right. Now in behavior that is, you know, several minutes long, that's fine for us. And to convince you that I'm not just looking at three of the best fitting neurons in my network, we also look at something that is traditionally done in experimental studies or in, you know, in, in every place today is what's called state space analysis. So what this does is takes the activity of this, you know, 10,000 unit network or the 10,000 unit, uh, 10,000 neuronal experimental data set and and condenses it down through dimensionality reduction into a 3D plot like this. So in gray is the entire network and its time course as a function, um, as a function of time in this three-dimensional space. And in red is the model. And once again, the take home here is this was just to tell you, and, and you know, in, in pieces that are get technical, like this one, for example, the key here is to say, listen, we're not interested in matching every little idiosyncrasy in the biology so far as we get the general behavior right. And so this type of analysis you will see in one more place. Right, so we're back to this picture. So we've got activity that is similar to data, right? The, everything on the left of the slide you've already seen before. Now I'm gonna show you what happens if you apply this current-based decomposition method or curved onto this particular data set and the model that has been fit to it. So you get activation similar to data, which is what I showed you from the example units as well as the population plot before. And you also get these directed interactions, which is really the power of this method. So what you get is the connections within the habenula in the blue block, connections within the telencephalon in the yellow block, and connections within the raphe in this red block. In addition, you get you know, the directionality and magnitude of the interactions between the telencephalon to the habenula in this block and from the raphe into the habenula in this block. These three blocks tell you what is the experience of the habenula from within other neurons in habenula or from different areas. Now, as I had hinted to before, the product of these two objects should give you the currents, right? So if I take the activity that is collected in the habenula and perform this curved exercise on it, it should divide itself into three blocks. The currents of the habenula from other habenula neurons, currents uh, into the habenula from telencephalon, and currents into the habenula from this raphe. And that's indeed what we see. Once again, everything on the, on the left remains the same. But now what we've done is taken the activity that was collected in the habenula, and we can decompose it into these three blocks. There's 2,200 habenular neurons, which means that every neuron in the habenula is receiving three different currents from other neurons in the habenula, from the raphe to the habenula, which is the thing in the red, and from telencephalon to the habenula, which is the thing in the yellow. So what it's able to do is to extract the within area current, which is the dot product of the activity times the habenula habenula submatrix, it can look at an inter-area current, which is the dot product of the activity with the raphe to habenula submatrix. It can also look at a third inter-area current, which is its activity dotted into the telencephalon to habenula submatrix. Taken together, right, the sum of these three things still gives you what you already saw before, which is the raw activity in the habenula that was recorded by the experimental colleagues or by looking at the average activity of the habenula as a function of time, which has this like ramping quality in the shocked fish. And again, this plot is something you've seen before. So what can we do with stuff like this, right? We've taken the activity that came out. This is, you know, a few of the 2200 neurons that I showed you there. Uh, and they do have this ramping like quality as a function of time. And in all of these plots, one thing to note is that the red are, is higher firing or stronger firing neurons, and in blue would be the weaker firing or not firing neurons. And so on top, 
once again, are the three currents that we extracted using this curved technique on the actual experimental output, right? So you can see here, and all three have been sorted in the same order. I've sorted these just to give your eye something to look at so it doesn't look all staticky. Once again, the high color, the, the, the warm colors mean higher firing, and the cold colors or the blue means low firing. And what we can do is the same state space view that I showed you before. To look at population-wide activity, which is these 2200 over long periods of time, we can do dimensionality reduction and get a snapshot, right? We can take this entire big matrix and condense it into just this one number that changes over time. And I'll tell you how doing that in the current space is helpful. And this is the last very technical bit, and then the rest gets intuitive again. So if you're, if I'm, you know, if I'm getting too into the weeds, it's because the weeds are slightly relevant to, to what we're trying to get at. So now what I've done is taken the activity that was recorded in the Habenula, and I've projected them into this new space, right? This new space now has three axes. It's once again the same sort of 3D plot that I showed you before, except now it's made up of activity in the Habenula, Habenula in blue, Raphe to Habenula in the red, and Telencephalon to Habenula in the yellow axis. In gray is the activity, and I have put dots in warm colors to indicate the times at which the shocks were delivered that were early, and in cold colors, the shock times that were late. So remember the story I told you. We, were, we went in looking for some kind of ramping activity within the Habenula, because that's what the outputs led us to believe. We thought we were looking for something in the habenula that got engaged as soon as the shocks came on to raise the alarm, to say bad things are happening, and then the rafe gets engaged. Instead, in this current view, what we're looking at is that the rafe to habenula, as you can see from all of these early time points being clustered in the subspace of the rafe to habenula, it's actually currents from the rafe into the habenula that are engaged early during active coping. And it's only later on that these other two currents, that is from habenula to habenula, or even from the telencephalon to habenula start to come on. Now, for those of us who find 3D plots kind of hard to look at, and I admit I'm one of those, I want to show you what happens if we just actually took these currents and plotted them as a function of time. Slightly simpler view. But the point of this slide is just that this current view gave us a surprising, unexpected effect. Which, which is that it revealed that the currents from the Rafe to Habenula were responsible for a very early interaction that was active coping. And so one thing that we wanna convince people of before I show you the time plot is that, well, this active coping phase, right? This is the same tail whips that you've seen before, number of tail whips plotted as a function of time. And you can see that this active coping phase, which is at the start of the pink bar, in which in the shocked fish is much higher than that in the, in the black in the control fish, is actually mediated by interactions that are not even central to within the habenula that they are actually driven by currents from the rafe into the habenula. And this effect is not manifested if you just look at the output of the habenula and even sort it, or if you look at the average population activity of the habenula neurons as a function of time, or if you do the traditional state space view of this kind of activity of the habenula plotted into the state space. Even here, these time constants are kind of mixed up. But you see this clear separation only in the current view. So we're, we're taking this curved method and we're proposing this as a powerful alternative to these other views of looking at, um, at measured output. But back to this, right? So what happens if you take this 3D plot that I showed you and plotted it straight as a function of time? So on top is the control fish. I've just picked a random control fish as a function of time. Now I've taken all of the tail whips and I've plotted them continuously in this black trace that you see here. So control fish have no reason to be worried. So they just kind of waggle their tails, you know, at some intervals. And so that's why the blue trace doesn't show any major changes. And in red is the raffe to habenula current, in blue is the habenula habenula current, and in yellow is the telencephalon current. You see the marked difference between that and a randomly picked shocked fish. Now here I've plotted it the same way. It's not even a particularly good shocked fish, and I'll tell you why. 
So here's the activity of the shocked fish plotted as a function of time. Now, initially, when the shocks come on at time zero, you see that there's an elevation in the tail whips in that the black is, you know, kind of ramping up. And then, you know, as the shocks build up, as you can see in the timing of the shocks are these little beads um, in pseudo color that you see marked on top. And at some point, the fish lapses into passivity, which is what you see here in the cessation of the tail whips. And, and as I said, this is not a particularly well-behaved shock fish because it does make a little exploratory tail waggle at the end of the experiment. But what you see here is the same effect. In red is a raffe to habenula current, which comes on early. So that ramp in the raffe to habenula current is much more coincident with the active coping phase or the early part of the experiment. And it's only later, after passivity has set in, which you can see in that the black trace is not waggling anymore, that the currents in the habenula, habenula, or telencephalon to habenula come on. And this trend holds even when we look across these types of models that have been fit to five different control fish or five different shock fish. Once again, the early or active coping phases seem to be driven by currents in the raffe to habenula subspace. And it's only later that the habenula, habenula, and telencephalon to habenula currents start to come on. And with that, um, I would like to get back to the question that we had first addressed, um, first posed, right? Which is, what is the brain-wide mechanism that mediates the active to passive coping in larval zebrafish? And I showed you an approach in which we build these neural network models that are constrained directly and at the outset from data and how reverse engineering them lets us infer these directed interactions as well as these currents, both of which are inaccessible from measurements alone. And so when I start to talk about brain-wide mechanisms that are mediating active to passive coping, which is essentially the answer to the question that I posed before, our results from this effort of using multi-region models as well as curbed the current-based decomposition is, well, first of all, we've shown that habenular interactions ramp with persistent and inescapable adversity which is the subject of the 2019 cell paper. And now what we're working on in light of this new discovery is that there's different roles of the raffe to the telens and raffe and telencephalon projections or brain-wide interactions into the habenula, some of which may be driven by fast changes, such as those in the currents, and some may be driven by slower, more structural changes that build up as a function of long experiences. And that's what I told you today. So was our story right? Were we right in the story of saying Habenula, you know, ramps up and says bad stuff's happening, projects to the raffe that says cavalry's here, I hope you feel better. If it didn't feel better, if the animal didn't feel better, who shuts the movement down? We couldn't find a single region that did that. However, in the process of looking for this infralimbic cortex-like thing, we found brain-wide changes and we found unexpected timing effects. And so our search continues. So going back to the big picture question I had posed, are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved and where they diverge? We're currently trying similar approaches on data from these other types of nervous systems. So what are the big advantages of this approach, right? Why do I bother with building these Lego facsimiles of very complex nervous systems and very complex phenomenology? So one of the advantages is that I get a facsimile, that I get a facsimile that I have assembled like a Lego model of the Death Star that behaves like the Death Star, that generates dynamics that are consistent with data from these types of experiments. But since I assembled the Lego of the Death Star, I'm able to infer from it consistent interactions, which reflect both within area connectivity changes and interactions between interacting, intercommunicating brain networks that correlate with behavioral state changes, which you couldn't do any other way. And finally, with this current-based approach that I showed you today, a current-based decomposition or curved, we're also able to disentangle timing effects distinct timing effects to disentangle early, intermediate term, and slower effects. So one of the things that we're deeply interested in trying is to scale this beyond the case of learned helplessness and go to phenomenology in other neuropsychiatric conditions, such as you know, behavioral inflexibility comes to mind, uh, inaccurate estimation of timing comes to mind, working memory deficits come to mind. Any place where there's a 
consistent phenomenology that seems to be impacted and particularly one in which the phenomenology is quantifiable and measurable, such as in movement shutdown. When movement stops, it stops, right? There's no guesswork. I can measure it. I can study it. And so that is the advantage of models in that we can find these unifying threads, not just across nervous systems, but perhaps across different types of pathological states. So one of the things we're trying to do is to take these types of multi-region RNNs and propose them as a powerful alternative to traditional functional connectivity methods, which have been used very profitably in, in uh, non-human primate and uh, human literature, um, because we can go beyond just correlations and start to look at the entire time course of these activity patterns and behaviors, because timing's everything. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention to the Brain and uh, Behavior Research Foundation, without whom I can 100% say this project would have never taken off. Um, and to, the, to our other funding sources who have enhanced our research in um, unexpected and tremendous ways. And now I'm ready to take any questions. Good. Thank you so much for sharing really some very complicated um, science um, but in putting it into um, much more uh, lay-friendly terms. So thank you for doing that. And thank you. I, Very kind. one question is, because this is obviously a, um, a newer approach to how we study the brain using these computational models. Tell us a little bit about what brought you into this field. How did you, how did you realize the, the potential of this approach? Well, honestly, I think it may be impatience. Uh, what computational models can add beyond experimental understanding or it is the fact that we're able to better leverage existing data, right? So we're in this era when there's lots of data. We're in this era when people are collecting and sampling huge amounts of data. So the need for this is clear, right? We need better analysis tools and we also need principal theoretical approaches to be able to best leverage them. So we also need to be able to generate new hypotheses and test them in a safe way. So we're able to, in these facsimiles, do simulated lesions and pertur perturbations and check effects of experimental therapies that we wouldn't be able to either ethically or technically do in the lab or in a clinical setting. We're also able to extrapolate beyond the details of a single experiment to look for principles across multiple different experiments. Uh, we're able to sort of take a, take a bird's eye view and we may be able to find unexpected commonalities um, if we look. And so I think those are the motivations for why I, I, um, I came to do computation. Good, thank you, thank you. And um, could you tell us a little bit about the potential of this approach uh, in looking at some of the more complicated behaviors, some of the more uh, complicated brains, um, you know, moving from the zebrafish to mice, rats, ultimately to humans. That's a, you know, it, it, it's a, that's a pretty deep question. So, you know, really the question would be, you know, uh, you know how can, you know, studying the larval zebrafish in however uh, deep way that one can help in understanding the human condition? Right. I mean, that's so. Uh, so phenomenologically, there are, you know, unifying principles in nature. Right. There's some basic machinery that's the same going from one biological system to the other, which is that neurons do fire fast and that they are connected by synapses. But the behaviors that all of these brains are capable of are slow. So what has the features of, you know, tractability and access where you can, you know, sample the whole entire brain and do um, experiments with a high throughput um, and make those experimental predictions that may be able to, you know, that we can then scale up these larger nervous systems. That's the whole game. But if we started from a very complex system with behavioral richness and a lot of uncontrolled variables, uh, we may get stuck because there's a lot of redundancies in those types of brains that we're also not able to sample. Um, and so I think the advantage of starting small is the tractability, the throughput, the control over the variabilities, 
um, variables. And, you know, model systems are the key to so many discoveries in the nervous system. I've plotted, you know, larval zebrafish mice and rats and humans, but, you know, everything from flies to yeast and worms. Um, and now we can really try to look at these unifying threads and see if we can make the translational um, translational jump to understanding the human condition. And I think it's possible if we look for such unifying principles and key divergences. I mean, they're both um, both both relevant. The um, I think it's particularly of interest to people now, especially during the, the stress of of COVID where that's ongoing stress and we talk about persistent stress. Um, where, where do you see um, this work taking us to better understand stress? Um, and we know how stress has such an effect on the brain and, and the rest of the body. Because um, I think that ultimately this is really very relevant um, to understanding the effect of stress on, on, on all of us. Absolutely, absolutely. So yes, I mean, you know, in these systems, the animal, and, you know, and all of these, right, persistent inescapable stress is the driver, but the driver, you know, like the devils in the details, the details go through a very complex transform in the brain where you're evaluating, you know, your own effort in trying to evade the stress or getting, you know, away from the stress and so forth. So it is, it is fairly complicated, but, you know, there's a diff there's slightly related but parallel research program in my lab that tackles a slightly different phenomenology, which is, I think, related to your question, uh, which is behavioral flexibility. And so, you know, one, one thing that often gets impacted in the face of persistent and inescapable stress, I showed you an extreme example where animals and people go from active to passive coping um, or advance their onset of passive coping. But, um, but another setting in which stress can impact the phenomenology is um, something like behavioral flexibility. So how is the, how does the brain, specifically the human brain, do so many different things and switch between them effortlessly. So what explains our multi-purpose functionality, right? And in the adaptive case, when we're living our normal lives, we're not perfect computers, so we don't do any one thing extraordinarily well, but we do many, many things and we're able to effortlessly switch between them. So one of the things that we're seeing over and over is that in response to stress, and also in many stress-unrelated neuropsychiatric conditions, there's behavioral inflexibility. So in those types of neural circuits, what seems to be impacted is the ability to track which action is currently being performed and when it's time to switch. And that functionality, the state tracker kind of functionality, is the one that's missing in both current AI models as well as in traditional neuroscience because we don't know where to look for such a signal. So my question is, who in the brain is tracking which task is currently taking place and when it's time to switch. So mathematically, we know it has to have a few properties, right? That thing has to have a steady representation during the time uh, that I'm engaged in a task, and it has to be able to switch at switch points, right? So a few things in which, you know, this type of state tracking ability is, is impacted, you can think of as also addiction because you may not know that you've, you know, stopped imbibing or may develop pathologies that way. But there's other neuropsychiatric conditions in which our current theory, at least, is that, or, or hypothesis, is that the state tracking ability might be the thing that's impacted, rather than our ability to actually complete the, those tasks. It's the order in which we're chaining those tasks, like beads on a string, that impacts our um, ability to switch and therefore manifests as behavioral inflexibility. So that's another direction in which in which we're going. But we're able to make these kind of abstract and um, and creative leaps because of the math. It, is this I? It, is this dependent upon you know extremely powerful computers to do these kind of mathematical uh, extrapolations? So I mostly do most of the work is um, on my laptop. So these models are extremely powerful in that they don't need a whole lot of compute. But when you're talking about brain-wide 
um, activity, right? You're talking about 40,000 neurons or 100,000 neurons in the brain of the larval zebrafish over several minutes, then we use cloud computing resources. But this isn't, you know, the same as saying how, you know, if I have to train a deep network, then I'm burning down a rainforest. It's nowhere on the scale of that. Okay. The, um, and let me ask you before we finish up, if you look out five years from now, 10 years from now, even beyond 15, 20 years, where do you see this going? What, what is your wish as to where this line of research will bring us? Oh, I love this question. Um, so I think what, what's going to happen or I, what I wish desperately to happen in the next from, you know, five to 15 year horizon is unifying well, actually three things. So unifying circuit models like mine, like the ones I showed you today, with other systems like the glial system. So investigating glial and neural interactions is something that we've just begun to do. Um, incidentally, it's an ongoing collaboration with two other brain and behavior research foundation, um, foundation beneficiaries, uh, Carl Dysroth and as well as Ann Schaefer. Um, at Sinai who studies glial and neural interactions in mice. So that's the first direction. The second, I think, is combining the kinds of models that I build, going in an entirely different direction, actually more, more like subcellular direction towards connectomics. So looking, and you know, mine is the generation in which we're gonna be able to extract the entire physical connectome um, of, of the mouse. And so to be able to combine these types of approaches and to make, make a claim about, you know, the matrices that I identify, to what extent are they similar or dissimilar to the structural connectome? That's another direction. Finally, I think the third direction is interactions of neural systems with physiological systems, such as vasculature or even the immune system. I think all three directions are relatively untouched by the computational neuroscience community, but they're getting ever more promising. So not just you know for me and my generation, but for upcoming generations of our of our young colleagues. Well, I hearing everything that you have to say, what you've done, what you're doing now, what you are planning on doing, gives me great hope that our understanding of the brain and therefore of how things sometimes go wrong will improve so that we will be able to develop new and better treatments. And I just think the work you're doing is extraordinary and want to thank you for sharing it with us and thank you for, uh, for, for all that you do. Thank you very much for having me. This has been um, this has been an extraordinary opportunity. And once again, without the Brain and Behavior Foundation, I wouldn't be here. Well, thank you. And the, the reason that our donors are so passionate about supporting science, uh, you're a perfect example of that. Thank you. Um, so thank you. I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All of the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Kimberly Carpenter, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University School of Medicine will present Sensory Challenges and Anxiety in Children with and Without Autism. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, March 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us. Take care.